Hi, my name is Elijah, and I have the privilege to serve as the creative pastor here at City Life Church. We just wanted to quickly thank you. Thank you for tuning in wherever you may be watching from. Hey, if you haven't already, please go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. We believe that God has an amazing word for you today. So let's jump into today's message. I'm going to continue a little bit, refresh what we learned a little bit, Pastor Tony, this last weekend on our Sila learning how to rest. Some of you guys don't know what that word means, rest. And so I'm going to recap the scripture we've been learning. This is our base scripture for this whole series. And uh, it's Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, if you want to read it with me. It says, then Jesus said, come to me. Everybody say, come. Come, come to me, all you who are weary and he carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That's his promise. Then he says, take. Everybody say, take. Take, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach, everybody say teach. teach. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. God's telling us just to chillax. He's telling you to relax, he's got this. And so we're learning that sila, the definition that Pastor shared last week, is sila is to reflect, to rest, to worship, to refocus, or to press pause on your life. Within the next chapter or the next paragraph, he says it's an invitation for us to rest and worship him. A gap from one season to the next. Pastor shared last week about Genesis chapter 1, how God designed from the day, from day one, he designed a work time and a rest time. He designed a hard work moment and a time that hit pause. And he said, we, we mentioned last week about in verse, uh, chapter, th sorry, chapter two, verse three, that God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because the day when he rested from all his work that he created. In other words, the seventh day was a day of rest, a day of sabbatical, get away, focus, refocus, pause, and get close to our creator. Then he also mentioned that in our Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment is to keep it holy. It's a Sabbath. It's a moment that we have a physical Sabbath and a, uh, a spiritual Sabbath. We stop to focus. We pause our bodies to relax and to rest. So my message today, it is my privilege and honor to share with you today, is about this topic, surrendering to rest. How do we surrender to that thing that we call sila, rest? Let me pray with you guys real quick. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the words that come out of my mouth. It's not my words. It's not my thoughts. It's, it's orchestrated by you. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. I pray for every ear, every mind, every heart to be intent to, to lean towards you and what you are speaking today. And I pray we don't leave here the same as we came here today, Father. We love you, we honor you, and we're just grateful for the word today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen. amen. Selah. Most people say Selah. It's actually Selah. Selah. A moment of rest and pause. And I heard this story, and it's actually a funny story, but it's a true story about these two guys that were chopping wood. They had this competition. And one guy said, okay, we got five hours to chop wood. Let's do this together. And so they all started at the same time. But this one guy, as he's chopping wood, he takes these breaks throughout the day. And, he, and the guy's still going at it, going at it, going at it, hitting the wood and chopping the wood. Matter of fact, they had a lunch break. And in the lunch break, the one guy took a longer break than the other. By the end of the day, after the five hours, they all get together, and he noticed that his pile, the one that took the most rest, the one that took the most time breaks, had more wood chop than the one that did not. And the guy's going, hey, man, I don't get it. I took less breaks, I took less, uh, less time in my lunch break, and you chopped more wood. The guy said, you don't understand. When I was taking a break, I was sharpening my ax. <laughs> Hello, this is a story, there's a truth to that. Most of us are going through life working so hard and working so hard that we don't take time to sharpen our axe or our blade. Hear what I'm saying? The truth is this, we lose our edge, we don't rest. Let me say it again. There's times that we gotta stop because the, the axe gets dull. Amen. It's time that we gotta stop and pause and sharpen the axe. We get frustrated, we work harder, not smarter, we work harder, we take too much time, and yet God wants us to pause and rest. Now, this is a message that's hard for me to preach, because I'm one that doesn't like to rest. 
So I'm talking to myself. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Right? So we need to surrender to rest. Surrender to rest. I'm type A. I'm driven. So I have to create. I have to accomplish. I have to do. I have to create. Just whatever. And that's a great char uh, character or trait to have, but it also could be your weakness. When it comes to resting, I sometimes think when I'm resting, I'm being lazy. Anybody feel that way? But th the problem is that Jason wants to be in control. I'm not talking to you guys, just talking to me. <laughs> like, I want to be in control. I want to handle everything. I want to have it my way. Ask my kids, they'll tell you when it comes to driving the car, I want to drive the car. But dad, I can drive, I want to drive the car. I want to be in control. I want the keys. Am I not, not am I lying? Okay. But here, here's what I'm getting at. Even when it comes to having a day off, I don't know how to handle my day off. Anybody else like that? You find things to do, even though you're supposed to be what? Resting. Oh, you all said that good. <laughs> so in my house growing up, I saw I'm Puerto Rican. Any Puerto Ricans in the house? <laughs> or better yet, how, how many New York Ricans in the house? <laughs> oh! So among family. Okay, you got this. So every, every weekend, my mother, love her, my mother, she would do this. On Saturdays, you're supposed to be resting. But man, in the morning, my mom put the salsa and the merengue on, and you knew it was on to start cleaning the house. <laughs> Anyone had that kind of mother? You know, I knew it was time to clean because when she put the music on, I smelled the fabuloso and I smelled the pine saw, and you knew it was on like Donkey Kong. It was time to clean, right? The Windex, come on. <laughs> my mom didn't know how to let us rest on the weekends. It was time to clean the clothes, wash the clothing, clean the house. Mop, sweep, everything. Anybody had that mom? Yeah. That, that kind of got driven to me as a kid. But God gives us three instructions in this scripture that I want to kind of point out this morning. And Pastor hit a lot of it last week. So I'm going to kind of highlight what some of the stuff he said and add some more. But he gave us three words. He said, I want you to come, I want you to take, and I want you to learn. So I want to talk about the first one. Come to me. It's actually the invitation. It's not a command. He says, just come to me. He didn't say, go to me. He didn't say, go over there. He said, come to me. In other words, he says, come to me like, not as a general or as a dictator, but more like a comforter, like a mom and her dad. Just come to me. You've had a parent, when you've just gone through issues, they just, just tell me about it. That's God's like, come to me. And then the second part I want to notice to that, that scripture, it says, to whom he speaks. He says, those people who are weary and heavy laden. Those people that are trying to carry it themselves, those people that are burdened, no solutions, they're carrying the weight of it, they're tired, no resources. It's almost like an oxen trying to do the work by himself. But he says, come to me. And then when you read that scripture, Pastor hit this last week about oxen, and when they're bound together, there is two yokes, and in the yoke, on one side of the other, there's a wood that keeps it bound together, and there's a harness on it. And I just learned this today. It was interesting. Somebody told me this today that in physics that one oxen can actually pull 5,000, but two oxen working together can pull 15,000. So in other words, God wants to partner with us, and we're trying to do it ourselves. We're trying to carry the weight. You can say amen or just say oh me, because we all do it. We want to be in control. We, we want to feel the weight of what goes on because we got this. We got this. Come on. I, I got this. This is my worry, God. This is my pain. This is what I got to deal with, right? And yet we don't have all the answers. Matter of fact, we're supposed to be dependent on God. That's what he created us to do, to depend on him. He never wanted us to be solos. Are you with me? Yes. So how do I find this? He says, when you come to me, you will find rest. Come on, sir. You got to catch that. When I come to him with my heavy ladens and burdens... He, his promise is to give me rest. But here's the thing. Most of you guys may be saying this today. Maybe you're sitting down. I can't go another step. I can't do this anymore. Or maybe I don't want to go on. I can't take another minute of this. Jesus promised when I come to him, he'll give me the rest. Number two, take. Take my yoke, not your yoke. Take my yoke, Jesus saying, upon you. Again, when we have the yoke together, we can pull even if we're going the same direction. 
One's leading the other. Matter of fact, he wants to lead us as we go. He wants to show us and not wander off the wrong direction. Any married people in the house? Man, you guys should be the loudest crowd in this room. I hope the person that's sitting next to you, you need to give him a shout out. How many married people in the house? Okay. Your spouse is going. <laughs> right? When you get married, a man and a wife, a husband and a wife, what they do this, they, they restrain their freedom from one another. Let me say it this way. When I got married to my wife, I laid down my rights and took on her rights too. And she laid down her rights and took on my rights. In other words, it's a covenant cooperating together in this freedom called marriage. It's never supposed to be bondage. And if you're having bondage in marriage, we need to pray for you. It's supposed to be working together. Amen? Amen. There is no bondage. Anyway, <laughs> that's a song. Together in covenant, amen? And that's the same way when we're in Christ. We are abiding together, husband and wife, Christ and the church, together abiding in this thing we called rest. He says, draw close to me. Because when we're close in bondage and we are bound together with Christ, you start to hear his heart about you. You start to hear what he says about you, what he feels about you. He cares for you. He is faithful towards you. I have to surrender. I have to submit. I have to take his yoke. I have to accept it. I have to value it. He is in control, not me. Amen. We have to be led by the Spirit. In other words, we have to die to ourselves. We don't like dying to ourselves. Come on, let's just be real. We want to do what we want to do. And if God says no, we're going, but why? Yep. God says, die to yourself. Die your, put your needs at the altar. Let me show you how to lead this life. Yep. He says, come. He says, take. And then he says, learn from me. I want to talk a little bit more about learning from Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was the ultimate example of how we should live this life and to learn the ways he went. Amen. He says, let me teach you. Another translation says, learn from me because I have a humble and gentle way. I have a heart towards you. That's why we got to meditate in God's word. The word of God shows us the ways of God. We learn the, the plans and the precepts from the word of God, how to walk this out, abiding in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you learn, if you look back, even the... The Israelites, they, they, before the exile, they had everything given to them. God opened a way for them. But they forgot who they were yoked with. They forgot who blessed them, who got them out of it. And yet they were, God was warning them and calling them back, but they did not learn from him. They went through great suffering. And I think when we go to church, we need to learn valuable lessons that God is trying to teach us and show us if we just open our hearts and listen to what he's saying. Amen. How do I share this yoke? We do it 24 hours a day. How I, what I do, what I say, how I act, what I watch, what I listen to. God, I'm going to yield to you. I'm going to learn from you. So I want to talk about some of these words, the word rest, the acronym R-E-S-T, rest. And I think the Lord wants to speak these words today. And I believe by the Holy Spirit, you're going to leave here not the same by listening to this. How can I rest in him? How can I rest in Christ Jesus? Number one is rejoice. You know, some of you guys are more critical than you are rejoicing. Let me just say it this way. We're easy to point out the bad instead of pointing out the good. And he says we gotta be, there's a lot to be rejoiceful and be thankful for. Matter of fact, we need to learn how to rest and spend time reflecting on the character of God and his goodness. Amen. Psalms 119 says this, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been so good to you. Come on, just thank the Lord he's been good to you. Amen. <laughs> Verse 8 says, for you, Lord, had delivered me from death. How many guys have been delivered from death in this place? Come on. 
my eyes from tears. He has wiped away those tears and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Aren't you glad that our God is protecting us? But another word if we are, I want to have rejoice, but also retreat. There's times we just got to shut everything out and retreat to be alone with God. In other words, a retreat, like the word says, you get away, a hiding place, a place. Some of you guys, it may be a place in your house that you feel more comfortable just to tune everything out and go away and spend time with the creator, the Lord, Jesus Christ. Look what it says here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Then Jesus, even Jesus said this, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He had to have moments to pause. I even say this, rest makes us better workers, but also better worshipers. When we rest, we have these solitude moments. We have a time to place to hear God's voice and retreat with him, spend time with him, talk to him. Prayer is not hard. We make it so difficult. You don't have to talk in old English. God, you heareth me, my prayer, if I, no. He just wants to hear your heart. You know the sad thing is that we'll talk to our boo, our best friend, family about our issues. We don't talk to God the same way. Come on. Do you know God knows what he's dealing with anyway? He wants to hear your heart. Open your mouth. It's not supposed to be a monologue. It's supposed to be a dialogue. God wants to speak back to you. The truth is this, he wants you to share his heart because God does know your prayers. He wants to answer your prayers, and he hears our prayers. Amen? Amen. Worship. It's not just a church worship, although we have amazing worships in all of our campuses. Yeah, come on, give it up for our worship teams. But it's not just the event. I think we just make it in an event when God wants your worship all the time. You can worship in the shower. You can worship in the car. You can worship at the beach. Just lift your voice and thank him for who he is. Amen? Soaking, not just, what is soaking? Soaking is getting alone. Maybe just closing everything out, laying down, close, turn the lights off, put on worship music. What is God speaking to me through that song? Put instrumental music, and while the instrumental is playing, Lord, talk to me. If you just stop and pause and listen, he'll talk to you. The problem is that we don't want to listen to what he has to tell you because we don't like it. <laughs> Come on, how have you guys done this before? God, I just need you to speak to me. And God says, don't do this. And you go, God, is that you? <laughs> Come on, you know I'm right. You know I'm right. He's talking to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, for real. Like, he does tell us what to do. The problem is we don't want to listen. But don't isolate. Get alone with God, but don't isolate. Get before his presence, but also be before people. Because I believe iron does sharpen iron. Yes. Amen. I love online church, and I think it's a great tool, but it's not, there's nothing like coming be in presence before God. Yes. Amen. Because two or three gathered his name, there he is in the midst. And there's more than two or three in this room, so God is so present. Amen? Amen. But E, examine. Examine. What do you mean, Pastor? Examine. Check your heart. So not only do we have to spend time and just rejoice and be thankful, not only we we get along with God and retreat, but we need to examine our hearts. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you're living in faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Examine. Lord, check my heart. We have gauges in our heart. These gauges start telling us what are going on physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Come on, these gauges are talking to us. We just got to read the gauge. Amen? Get in this word. They said it again. Get in this word. I don't like the word of God. Find a Bible you can read. There's so many translations. You may even laugh. When I started reading the Bible growing up, I got the International Children's Bible. Yo, if you haven't seen that Bible, y'all need to read it. It's the most simplest form of faith 
to teach kids about God's word, and it's easy to read. So if you're saying, I don't like the, the New King James, find a Bible, the Passion, the Message Bible, New King James, NIV, NLT, there's so many out there. But get in his word. What is the Bible saying about my attitude? What is the Bible saying about my condition? My, you know that scripture is about healing? You won't know once you get in there. That scripture is about my faith, about my hope, my anchor, my family, my marriage, my finances, my future. Amen. Amen. Even about my fears, my worries, my troubles. Get in there, amen? But when I stand and read on his word, he shows me his ways. He shows me his words. He shows me his hand, his work. Whew. But the last one, the S, is silence. Hey, let's do something real quick. Let's be silent for about, really, let's be, last service, somebody didn't pay attention. Let's be silent for five seconds. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Now, when you were silent, what did you hear? Everything around you. I could hear the fans on the stage playing right now, the fans off the, the lights. Because my ear is now attuned to what's around me, not so much what's in front of me. Guys, catch this. God is speaking all the time. We just don't take a time to be quiet. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Another translation says, cease striving and know that I'm God. Or stop your fighting is another translation. Fighting with who? You're fighting with yourself. Stop fighting. Stop striving. Stop moving. Just be still and know that I am the God of your life. Stop pushing yourself. I am God. That's what he's saying. And let me be God. But turn off our devices, man. These things are great, but they're dangerous. Listen, you've ever been trying to get along with God and you still have your phone with you and every text comes in when you're with alone with God? Come on, let's be real. Bing, email, right? A text message, a social media post or something. Turn off your phone, turn off your computer, turn off your TV, turn everything off. Silence the devices, unplug for a moment, and allow God to speak to you. But God speaks to me through messages. But you know God speaks better than a message? Tune out the noise. Matter of fact, rest provides fine-tuning for God's messages, hearing God's messages amidst the static of life. Whew. Still your mind, still your thoughts, listen, practice it. Amen? Amen. Last one, trust. There was a song we used to sing in kids' shirts. I got all these kids' shirt songs popping in my mind, Ties. I don't know why. But there was a song that used to go, T R U S T, that's how it has to be. I think it's so easy when I T R U S T. Trusting, trusting, trusting in the Lord, learning from the Bible and hearing on his word. That's an old school song. But anyway, here's my point. <laughs> we know that we have to trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him. We got to trust him. That's a hard word. Because we got to be in control. Trust takes faith and obedience. Trust him. Trust him for your provision. Trust him for your family. Trust him for your things. He will supply. Don't worry about it. Trust him. There's two words translated from, and we read it back. Rest and quietness also is the root word from peace. So in other words, if we read Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Tell God about it. Amen? Thank him for all he's done. Then you experience God's peace or rest or quietness. Amen? Which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you focus on your worries, you focus on your fears, those fears and worries will master you. Instead of your master taking care of those things. So Lord, help me. Psalms 116 verse 7, the passing translation says this, 
Relax and rest. Be confident and serene for your Lord rewards fully those who simply trust in him. There's a reward in trusting. As a matter of fact, I heard this story. This guy, this old man was falling off a cliff. He's about to die, but he throws out one hand miraculously as he falls. He grabs a branch, and he cries out, is anybody out there? He hears his voice, yes. He says, who are you? I am God. I'm here to save you. Then he goes, wonderful. What should I do? He says, let go of the branch. He goes, is anybody else out there? <laughs> we laugh, but there's truth in that. Amen? He's telling you to let go of certain things, and we still hold on to it. Come on. And I love the story in Matthew Chapter 14, verse 13 and 21, when you hear the story how the God multiplied the fish and the loaves. But I want to read the part before he made the multiplication. God was full of compassion that he knew the needs that they had. The disciples are so concerned about their time, their stomach, probably their family. Who knows? They were so concerned about what was going around them, they forgot the needs that were in front of them. And God's so concerned about your needs, about the things around you. Are you guys hearing this? And Jesus, it said that Jesus was full of compassion. He healed the sick. And then when it's evening, the disciples came and said, the hour's late, Jesus. Send them away. Like, I got to go eat my rocangandules at home, and I'm tired. <laughs> That's rice with pigeon peas if you don't know Spanish, okay? <laughs> We're tired. I got a roast in the oven, and it's time. It's late. And God says, hold up. What do we have? In other words, he was concerned about their needs. The disciples were concerned about their needs. And he tried to show them, if you just focus on what I can do, I'll take care not only of their needs, but also your needs. And he multiplies. You know the rest of the story. He says, don't, give them, don't send them away. Give them something to eat. In other words, I'm concerned about what you need. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10, it says, for all those who enter to God's rest have rested from their labors. How many guys are toiling, trying to work, work, nothing wrong with working, but we try to work so hard to accomplish so much, and God goes, I got you. Just chillax. I got you. Can you rest from your labors at times so that I can talk to you, that I can show you my hand, my glory, that I can do it is not on your terms only? And it says that he rests from the labors just as God did after creating the world, so let us do our very best to enter to that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, guess what happens? We will fail. What you value, you make time for. Let me say it again. Somebody needs to hear that. If you value your marriage, you'll take time for your marriage. If you value your kids, you'll take time for your kids. If you value your the church, you'll take time for the church. But if you value God, you'll take time for God. Amen? Amen. And here, here's the dilemma, and I think all of us, including me, have struggled with this one statement. And hear me out. I believe by faith. I trust God by faith. I know God is able. I know God can. God has shown himself strong and mighty in my family. But one thing we struggle with is this. We got to surrender our expectations to God too. Yep. Pastor, what do you mean? See, we surrender our life, we surrender our plans, we surrender our control, and he, he wants us and allows us to live in the will of God. Amen? Amen? But there's another step. We also must surrender our expectations because it causes us to live in the fullness of God. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I've done this before. I've come to God and I gave God my demands and I told him what I wanted and what I needed and God does want to supply my need. But the problem is that God also knows that if he gives me certain things I ask for that is not good for me, he won't give it to me. If you can't, hunt, if you can't listen, if you can't handle $100, don't ask for a million. Come on, are you hearing me? 
Many times we can miss what God is doing and saying because our expectations are something else than what God is actually saying. We tell God how to do it. We tell God how we want it. But we don't die to ourselves. Oh, I know I'm preaching. Because I struggle with this. We got to get out of the way. Maybe the things we're expecting are good for us, and the Bible says he knows the plans that he has for you. Right? God wants us to give us the desires of our heart. How many of you guys preached that before? God wants to give me the desires of my heart. He's mine. She's mine. But God also knows maybe that person is not really good for you. Oh, come on. I know I'm preaching good. You don't have to tell me. I know. I know. <laughs> Why am I saying this? Because listen, look what it says in Psalms chapter 37. I read this before and I went, man, this, this, oh, thank you, Jesus. Psalms 37, verse 4 through 5, the Living Translation says this. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. We stop there. And we, we pray that. Oh, my heart's desire. Right? But look what the next part says. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. We don't like that part. Committing. Or God shall supply all my needs. How many of you guys preached that before? And it says next, according to his riches and glory. When we misquote that, we go, God shall supply all my needs. Money, 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 money. And he does want to bless you. I'm not saying, please don't take that wrong. But I, I'd rather submit to what, how he wants to bless me and how he knows what's best for me and how it's best fitting for me than me trying to tell God what to do for me. Guys, listen up. We get our desires in the way many times with our prayers. We get selfish. We get fleshy. Amen? Me, myself, and I. It's all about me. Or how about what is his desire? What is his will? What is his plan? He knows what I need, when I need it, and his timing. He knows what I need at the right time. He knows, he's, I know he's got my family, and that may not be my timing, but God knows he's working behind the scenes, things I don't see that he is working on their hearts and their minds that I don't see, but I want God to touch, and God will, but it's not my timing, it's not my will, it's his will. Amen. God works all things together for those who love him. He's working it out. He's the orchestrator of all things. He is, the, he is moving the pieces. But we meet people, and I've seen this before. We try to control God with our allegiance. We do this. God, you know I really love it. But if you, Let me just say, I wrote this down. I don't want to say it wrong. If you really love me, Jesus, you will. Be careful. That's manipulation in disguise. Learn from Jesus. Jesus did this. Father, it's not my will but your will be done. I lay down my life, my plans. He was 100% God as much as 100% man, and he laid down his life. He surrendered to his father, and God took control of that. I want to show you something. This is some of us. We come to church. Whoo, this is heavy. <laughs> We come to church, we want to be in control. So we'll walk through these doors. My family burdens, my financial burdens, my future, oh, my marriage. I don't know how to handle this. And we'll come to church like this. Listen, you're laughing, you're clapping, but most of us do this. We fake it, we pretend it. We, uh, you can't fake God, God sees everything. So we come to church and we're like, God, I love you. I love you. Let me, let me lift my hands. Oh, I can't. I can't. This is heavy. Oh, oh, I don't have time to give. My hands are full. I don't have time to do. Oh, I can't, God, but I love you. I love you. Oh, I love you, God. And we come to church. Listen. Hold on. Hear, hear me out. Hear me out. And all he said was an invitation. He wasn't demanding. Matter of fact, 
It wasn't even condemning. Even when you don't have belief, look what he does. Come to me. I know what you got, the burdens. I know you got the weight. I know you worry about your kids. I know you worry about your marriage. I know you worry about your future. Can you just come to me? Why? If you come to me and you take my yoke, matter of fact, drop it. <laughs> Give it to me. Give me all this worry. Give me all this fear, all this burden, all this thing that's dragging you down. If you just come to me, take my yoke, not yours, take my yoke. I will give you rest. Learn from me. I'm humble. I'm gentle. Woo! Listen. Oh, I, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. We are striving on our own strength. I don't know who this is for. You can't shut your mind off. The enemy's lying to you. I'm telling you, I struggle with this. If I work harder, I make more money. If I work harder, I make more for my family. And yes, that's true, but it is not me that's my provider. It is God who provides for me. <laughs> listen, listen carefully. He wants to carry our burdens, our weight. And this is what he tells me, me, Jason. I'm sure he tells you this. How long can you keep this up? Listen, this week we... Um, I, I got my voice back, but this last week, man, it was crazy. Um, we had a, a celebration uh, service for um, Mar Marian, and it was beautiful, by the way. Thank you guys for coming and supporting and being part of that for Jesse and his family. But we had a celebration of life service, and I was not feeling good. My, my throat was gone. I couldn't talk. I, I, sound like, I sound like Kermit the Frog, actually. And then my daughter came back from Africa from a mission trip, and we had our family together, and, and I was just going, 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 and then... The Lord spoke to me and said this, Jason, are you going to practice what you just preached? You're going to preach on Sunday? Can you just stop for a second and just rest? The problem is that we want to do it all. And God's telling us to stop. I want to read this scripture to you. This spoke to me. Psalms chapter 127, verse 1, two, verse one and 2. Thank you, Jesus. If it's not the Lord who builds the house, the builders are wasting their time. If it's not the Lord who watches over the city, the guards are wasting their time. It is a wasted time to get up early and stay up late, trying to make a living. The Lord provides for those he who loves, even while you are sleeping. That's a weight off my chest. Like, in other words, when I go to bed at night, God's still working on my behalf. When I'm worried and fearful of what's going to happen, what's going to happen next, even the birds don't worry about how their food is coming and the flowers don't, we, they don't have to worry. Why? Because God takes care of them. If God takes care of them, how much more would he take care of us? We just, read a, we just sang a song today, and it spoke to me again. I put my trust in Jesus. He won't fail us. He won't fail us. He never fails. Rain came, wind blew, but my house is built on you. You guys, we, we sing this, but this is the truth. How about, I'm safe with you because I'm going to make it through. Why? Because I'm yoked with Jesus. I abide with him and he abides with me. I'm going to have the worship team come out. I want you guys to stand up this morning. And this is what the Lord, and I, I, this, I was sitting there and listening to that song again. It was hitting my, my, my head. And something that Pastor Brian said last service at the altar, I'm going to kind of, a little bit of it. But the Lord reminded me, and I, I and how many guys in this room have a hard time shutting your mind off? You know, we had our VBX. We were talking to parents in the, 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 the youth sanctuary about things that we have to help their kids to go through, like maybe the struggles they're going through. And I said something to the parents, and the Lord reminded me. 
I said, you know, sometimes our kids get bad nightmares, bad dreams, bad things, because before they go to bed, they're either watching something that's violent, they're watching something that's not good for them, they're watching, I'm just going to be straight up, so hear me out, you're watching sex scenes, you're watching, you're listening to music that has a lot of garbage in it, and, and it's just feeding you, and you're just hearing it, and you're watching it, you're watching the violence, you're watching the sex, you're watching the, the cursing, the lying, the cheating, the, all this stuff that, you, and I'm not, I love movies, but hear me out, we go to bed, before we go to bed, we watch that, and then we, we, and we go to bed, your, your brain's going, and it's trying to shut down. Instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to calm your mind and your brain to rest, we are working overtime in our mind and our brain to figure things out. And God says, that was never intended for you to do. Let me be the one that helps you rest. Yeah. And so we run to medications. We run to marijuana. We run to gummies. We run to all these things that try to calm us down. And the one that can calm you down beyond all of that, number one, is Jesus. Yeah. Amen. But we got to do our part. Listen, we got to do our part. And this is what I mean. I'm not bashing the things I just said. Hear me out. I'm saying this. There's a part that we have to play in order for God to move. He said, come to me. That was an invitation. Then he says, take. That's my responsibility. And then he says, while you come to me and you take, the next thing is, learn from me. In other words, I'm being taught by the master. What did he do? that gained victory in his life. Number one, it was not his will. It was not his life. He laid it down willingly. So I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but even as I'm talking, your mind's going different directions. First of all, we gotta come to him. Some of you guys walked in this day, you're worried. You're fearful. All he wants you to do is just come to him. He said, don't try to figure it out. It's not your strength. Because in your weakness, I'm made strong. But it's my response to come to him. And again, he wasn't saying it as a condemnation. He wasn't saying it as a non-believing faith act. It was, I know where you're at. I know what you're going through. Stop pretending I don't know. Stop acting like it's okay when it's not. Just come to me. So I have the prayer partners come to the front. Pastor Brian, you come up too. Um, and if you're here this morning, and this is a really an invitation that I really, really want you to listen to. You can be a Christian and still not trust God. You can love Jesus and still not hand everything over to him. Let me say it this way. You can pray and still not pray certain things that you know that God wants you to pray, but you're afraid to hear what he has to say, so don't pray it. So you just pray what you want to pray to sound good, so you can only pray the prayers you want to be answered, and God's going, I want all of you. And I know the Holy Spirit's talking, he's talking to me. You want rest? Come to him. You want peace, quietness, stillness? Come to him. Because when we give it to him, he exchanges the light load that we need. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Our church is not built on one individual, but on the sacrifice of so many. And so you being a part of that means so much to us. Our vision here at City Life is to reach the lost, help restore what has been broken, and to release people into their God-given purpose. If you would like to partner with us today, text GIVE to 844-311-1777 or visit our website. For more great content and messages, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also download our City Life app and follow us on Facebook and Instagram while you're at it. Our services are at 930, 1030, and 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'd love to have you be with us in person at one of our locations. And like we say here at City Life, go and be the city.